working all things out, working all things out. together and sing this next song together.
invite you to grab a seat if you're here in person. If you're at home, do whatever you want to do. Stand, sit down. But I'm so grateful that you're here. If I haven't met you before, my name is Tim Ward. I'm the pastor here at Crossroads. And I'm just so thankful that we get to worship together today. Again, whether you're here in person or online, I'm so grateful. I wanna encourage you, if you're in person, to take out your worship guide. If you're online, you can go to crossroadsnova.org slash here and you can fill this out. But inside, there's a couple of things. One thing is there's a connection card. And this connection card is an opportunity for us to connect with you. If you're new today or you've been new in the last few weeks, let us know that. We wanna know you. We want you to know we're praying for you. There's a spot on the back where you can write a place to, to, to pray for, something that's important to you. And I wanna encourage you, hang on to those till the end of the service because you're gonna hear about some things at the end that you may wanna participate in and connect with. So please take the time to fill one out. I'd love everybody here to fill one out because we're gonna pray for you. And there's a couple of things I wanna point out to you, things that are going on. Today in worship, we're gonna talk about a new series, Leadership 101, and it's gonna be tempting in this series. It's gonna be really tempting for you to think about sort of the political world. It's gonna be tempting because, you know, there's this day coming up on Tuesday. I hear it's election day or something, right? It's gonna be tempting for you to think about other people in your life that you wanna point to and say, look at all the things they're not doing, but this series is about you. It's about me, it's about a time for you to be reflective. And it's a time for you to think about your own leadership and who God calls us to be. And today's also a day in the church where churches all over the world are celebrating what's called All Saints Day. Right, it's a time to remember the people that we've lost. Maybe you've lost somebody that's really important to you over this last year. Maybe you've lost somebody years ago that's really important to you, but it's a time to remember. So as we talk about leadership today, I want you to think about those people in your life people that have been leaders, people that have given you the pieces of who you are that help you lead well. So I invite you to process that and think about that. Also, if you wanna connect with others in this church, I wanna encourage you to think about November 19th, coming here to the church, and we're gonna decorate from, for Christmas. We're gonna get the whole church decorated from 10 to four, and it's gonna be fun. We're gonna have like fun food and Christmas music, and the biggest thing is, yes, we wanna get the church decorated, but the bigger thing is we wanna connect with you. What a great way to connect. Everybody can do that. There'll be something here for everybody. So sign up for that day. Email Susan, it tells you to do that. We would love to have you do that. Thanksgiving Day race. We have a big race coming up. This year there's a shift in the race on Thanksgiving morning. It's that all the, the proceeds that come in for it, yes, they'll go to educate kids in Uganda, but they're also going to all of our other serve things. They're gonna go to, to expand what we're doing to feed people who are hungry here locally. They're gonna expand what we're doing to help people get homes and they're gonna expand what we're doing to help people with all of the different things that God calls us to do in this church, in this community. So I wanna encourage you, sign up to volunteer with that, sign up to run, walk, whatever you wanna do. Go out to the table after worship, it'll be out there. And the last thing I'm gonna mention right now, trust me, I have many more things I'll mention throughout the morning, but the last thing I wanna mention is this estimate of giving card. There's one in everybody's worship guide. And if you haven't filled one out, we're, we're hoping to get about 40 more of these. We think there are about 40 more of those out there that you can fill out today and you can put in when the ushers come around to receive the time of giving. And this is something that's a real benefit to your church, but I think it's a bigger benefit to you. How are you thinking about your finances over the next year? How are you thinking about how you're gonna be generous? So I wanna encourage you to do that. Fill that out, place it in the giving basket as it comes around. The ushers are gonna receive giving this morning and know that your giving is transforming the world. If you don't get the newsletter that Kathy sends out on Wednesday, sign up for it because every Wednesday she's talking about ways that your generosity is changing the world. You're transforming people's lives. So as the ushers come, you can place your estimate of giving card in there. You can place it when you come to communion or you can give your time of giving too. But no, God so deeply loves you.
wonder if you'd pray with me and for me this morning. Gracious God, on this day where we remember those who have gone before us, maybe those that we've lost in this last year, those, God, who we've lost in years past, I think about people who loved me so deeply. I think about my grandparents. I think about beloved people when I was growing up. I think about pastors in my life who have passed on. I think about people in the church. And I thank God, I thank God about all the people represented here and their loved ones. And I give you thanks. God, I pray that as I speak today, in some way you might speak through me. God, that you would give us ears to hear what you want us to hear. You'd open our minds to understanding that our hearts would even be willing to be transformed. Come, Holy Spirit, and be present. Amen. So you probably have noticed lately that our Supreme Court does not necessarily have the best reputation right now. Lots of people are talking about it, lots of people are thinking about it, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that this morning for those of you who are already uncomfortable that I became political. I am not trying to be political in any way, shape, or form. But something happened a few years ago on the Supreme Court that I think is worth note. Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg is somebody that a lot of people knew, and as soon as she died, I started watching films on her and videos on her because there were so many people that were talking about her life. And I wanted to know more because I am not a person who spends a lot of time following the Supreme Court. So I wanted to know more. And I came across, this was in 2020, I came across an article in Time Magazine that I thought was really interesting. And what it was, it was the other justices offering comments about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life and about the work that she did. So I wanna share some of those comments with you this morning. Chief Justice John Roberts Jr. said, future generations will remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg as we knew her, a tireless, and resolute champion of justice. Justice Clarence Thomas, as, an outstand, as outstanding as she was as a judge, she was an even better colleague, unfailingly gracious, thoughtful, and civil. Justice Samuel Alito, Justice Ginsburg will go down as a leading figure in the history of the court. She will be remembered for her intelligence, learning, and remarkable fortitude. She has been and will continue to be an inspiration for many. Justice Elena Kagan, to me, as to countless others, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a hero. As an attorney, she led the fight to grant women equal rights under the law. As a judge, she did justice every day. And Justice Neil Gorsuch, for 40 years, Ruth has served the American people as one of our most distinguished judges. Her sacrifices for the country were many, but always performed with honor. Isn't that remarkable? Not all of those people are ideologically the same. Do you know that? Yet they were shocking, right? Yet they were able to speak about her life. So I think about the profound relationships that were there, right? The things that you don't see when you're watching the proceedings, the profound relationships that were there between people who had given the, their lives to something. I think about how they led together Today we're starting a new series we're calling Leadership 101. One of the things I think that's needed in our world right now, in our nation, in our communities, in our households, is leadership. I think it's a really, really important thing. And as I said earlier, when I talk about this series, I am not going to talk about the government. I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for on Tuesday. Amen? Amen. Right? I'm not gonna do that. I'm, I'm gonna tell you it's a good thing to vote. I, I feel pretty strongly about that. But what I'm gonna talk about is our own leadership, because here's the temptation. The temptation in this series is gonna be for you and me to go, I'm gonna look at all the ways that so-and-so is not a leader. I'm gonna look at my boss and say, here's the way my boss can be a better leader. I'm gonna look at, so, at, at, at my partner and say, this is how my partner could be a better leader. I'm gonna look at my neighbor and say, this is how, this is about you. How can you and I be better leaders? What can we do? And I think as people who call ourselves the church, we are called to lead. We are called to lead in our communities and not lead people in a way that convicts them about who they're not, but lead people into loving them for who they are. That's what we're supposed to do, to hold on to that for people. So in this series, which, which I wanna tell you, I think it's a hard time to lead right now too. 
We're in a very divisive time. We're in a very divisive time in families. I know I've got members of my family who don't agree with me on things. I know that's surprising. You've got members of your family. You've got members of your community. So it's a hard time to lead. But in this series, we're gonna talk about three characteristics over the next three weeks of strong leaders. One is strong leaders own up to their mistakes. That's a big one. We're gonna think about that this morning. Strong leaders choose humility and strong leaders have faith. And we're gonna talk about what has faith, have faith means. Now I'm gonna talk about something today that might be a phrase that you don't regularly think through when you hear leadership. I'm gonna, there are lots of definitions of leadership out there, but I'm gonna talk about something called servant leadership. And if you don't know what that is, it's okay. I'm gonna walk you through it. We're gonna talk about it today. Because servant leadership is a term that was coined by Robert Greenleaf. He's a 20th century researcher who was skeptical about traditional leadership that was all about getting to the bottom line, traditional leadership that was about getting to the ultimate goal, styles that focused more on authoritarian relationships between employers and employees. And he said what he came to, his observations led that a servant leader approaches situations and organizations from the perspective of the servant first, looking to lend their presence to answer the needs of the organization and to people. They seek the, to address the wants and the requirements as their priority with leadership to be pursued secondarily. What does that mean? Servant leaders focus on people. Servant leaders don't just focus on the bottom dollar or the, or the end goal. Servant leaders focus on walking with people, caring for people. It's one that starts with the people and then gets to the end. Um, you may not know it, and I don't even know her, but Robin Bickey's here. Robin Bickey's my coach, so I'm, I'm grateful for you. I'm so grateful for you. And Robin gives me lots of things and great things. And one of the things she gave me to read, um, I created a little card and I put it on my uh, computer screen. It says, my opportunity as a leader is to show up, create space, and hold a powerful container of potential for the people I lead. Isn't that cool? Hold a powerful container of potential for the people that I lead. If I'm focused on people, I'm about their potential. If I'm focused on people, I'm about caring for them. A good example of this in the business world is the previous CEO of FedEx. I don't know if you know this guy. FedEx was founded in 1971 by Fred Smith. And Fred Smith came in as a different leader and he said, I'm going to lead differently. He was about people first. He believes when people are placed first, they will provide the highest possible service and profits will follow. What came out of this model that he was starting as a servant leader and that he pushed forward was this people service profit philosophy. And what happened was FedEx grew because he cared about the people. People wanted to stay. People often leave people. They don't often leave organizations. People leave people because people make you feel valued or devalued. Now, is this just him giving a good TED talk? No, this comes from the Bible, right? Servant leadership comes from scripture. It's there and it's all over the place. And we have good examples and we have bad examples. So in this series, I'm gonna focus on the person of David. If you don't know who David was, he was a little kid, he threw some rocks, down went a giant, later he becomes king. That's all you need to know, right? David is a king. And in this part, David has a leadership position. He's in a place where he has said multiple times that David is one after God's own heart. David is a leader to watch. David is a leader to follow. He's the first good king of Israel, the previous king, not such a good king. He's a humble leader, but it doesn't mean that he doesn't make mistakes, and it doesn't mean that David doesn't have problems. So I wanna give you a place where David went off course. It's in 2 Samuel 12. Nathan is a friend of David's, by the way, who we're gonna read about. It says, Nathan said to David, you are the man. You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, and if you've taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. 
Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Again, anybody who says the Bible's boring, <laughs> right? This is not a boring story. So what's going on? Where does this come from? Why does he start off saying you are the man? David is king. David is in his palace. He looks over. He sees Bathsheba. She's taking a bath outside, which is normal for the time. Right, Bathsheba's taking a bath, and he says, I want that woman. I want her to be my wife. Then he sends her husband into battle, puts him at the front of the battle, knowing that he will die. Now, because everyone puts such trust in David as a king and as a leader, Uriah says, of course I'll go. David, I would do anything for you. I would respond, and I would do it. So Uriah is responding to David's leadership. Now, Nathan has told, the way that Nathan gets to this, because he knows probably going to David and simply saying, David, you're a jerk. You did something really bad, it's not gonna work. He tells him a parable. And this parable is really important because he tells him a parable of a man who comes into a town looking for a sheep. And he says, there are two people that have sheep. One is a very poor man and he has one sheep and that sheep is a member of his family. That's how important that sheep is. The other is a very rich man who has tons of sheep. And the man who comes into the town says, I want the sheep of the poor man. I want to take the one from the poor. And he says to David, what then, David, should that, what should we do with that man? And he says, that man should be put to death. That's a terrible thing to do. And that is where Nathan looks back at him and says, you are that man. You're the one. Or, according to Yoda, I think we have a picture. Nope, just skip all that. Go to the Yoda picture. The man you are. Yes. Right? You are the man. That's what he's saying. David says that man should surely die. Now, here are some things. What can we get glean from this? Let's go back, Don. What can we glean from this? We can glean some things. Here's the first thing. Servant leaders surround themselves with people who share truth. Again, Nathan says to him, you are the man. He shares truth with him. He, you know, most people, when somebody is a leader around you and they're doing crazy things and you're afraid of them, you don't say anything. But David surrounded himself with people who would tell him when he messed up. And listen, this is a big mess up. Would you agree? Like, this is a big deal. But Nathan calls him out on it. It's very dangerous because Nathan could be put to death at any point in time by the king. But he calls him out on it. When he says, you are the man, it's not how we often think of it. We, we hear that phrase and we're like, oh, that's cool, right? You're the man. When he says that, he's like, you're the man that's caused problems. You're the man that's caused pain. He tells him that the parable is speaking of him. He tells him God has shown great confidence in him to be a leader. God had trusted him. God had given him, the scripture says, all of your master's wives. What that meant was God had given him the previous king's wives. He had plenty of women to choose from. And yet he took the one that wasn't his. He took the one that belonged to Uriah. This phraseology means that he did something he shouldn't have done. Look how bluntly Nathan speaks to David in this passage, and I'm sure it's not the first time. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. I mean, this is powerful what he says to him. But remember, Nathan is one of his most trusted people. So as a leader, David has surrounded himself with somebody who's gonna call out his mistakes and name them. And that's the second part. Servant leaders own up to their mistakes. David's responsible. There's no question. He sent Uriah to the front of the battle knowing what the outcome would be. He broke the command of God. Servant leaders listen. They don't just push forward with their agenda. They don't throw out all of their mistakes. He says, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. Have you ever met somebody, and I don't want you to raise your hand, have you ever met somebody who tries to justify all the things they've done, the ways they've hurt people? Maybe that's you. I know that's been me before. 
where, where I try to justify something that I did, well, you just heard it wrong. You experienced it wrong. Servant leaders own up to their mistakes. What would our community look like? What would our political world look like? If leaders owned up to their mistakes, what would your home look like if leaders did that? You know a phrase that I use, I'm sorry, but? You know, I'm sorry is a complete sentence. But means that you're not really sorry. We got a lot of buts. I'm sorry, but, right? We simply have to own when we're wrong. We simply have to own the mistakes that we make. Justifying our mistakes doesn't make them better. They're still mistakes. It doesn't make them disappear. We have to own them. And then here's the third thing. When it comes to servant leaders who are people of faith, servant leaders know that they're forgiven. Isn't that the beautiful thing about God? When we screw up, and I do, over and over and over again, and I say, God, I'm sorry. God forgives me in the midst of it. Nathan says, now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. David's forgiven. David's forgiven for the mess that he's made. David genuinely grieved. He genuinely repented. He's truly sorry. He's repented in his heart. David confesses his sin and he names it his sin and that's why we wanna call it that. David confesses his sin to to Nathan. David knew that the penalty for adultery was murder, for murder was death. The penalty for adultery and murder was death. Both were very hard to carry out against a king. So he could have just said, whatever, it doesn't matter. But he owned up to it. He was more worried about how God would look at him than he was how a human would look at him. He knew that was important. So I want you to think about what might this look like for your friends and family? What might this look like this week When somebody comes to you, which I hope you have people in your life that do, and say, hey, when you did this, it hurt me. When you did this, it was wrong. When you did this, it was a mistake. What might it look like for you to say, wow, I'm really sorry, instead of giving your litany for reasons why you did it? What might it look like to own up to the things that we do? Because with God and with humanity, repentance leads to forgiveness. When I go to my wife, and I know I need to do it often, and I say, hey, I'm really sorry for that thing that I did, she always forgives me. Always, always, always. So I wanna encourage you to do something for you this week. I wanna encourage you to take time to do one of two things. I wanna encourage you to take time, I'm all about writing letters, to write a card to somebody that you need to ask for forgiveness from, that you need to own up to a mistake, to say, hey, this is something that I've done. And if you don't have something like that that you can think of in your life, I want you to think of a person who has been a servant leader in your life. Somebody who has demonstrated this capacity to own up to mistakes that were made. Somebody who has demonstrated this capacity to focus on people first. And I wanna encourage you to write them a letter. It can be an email. It can be a text. But write them, because I'm gonna tell you it is powerful. It is powerful when you name that. I wrote a letter to a servant leader in my life this week that I wanna share with you because I I try to do what I ask you to do. Her name is Tammy, and this is somebody who leads a board that I sit on. And I said, Tammy, I'm so grateful for the time that I spent under your leadership. You have so many qualities that demonstrated a servant leader to me. Perhaps one of your greatest qualities, one of the greatest was your ability to apologize when you made a mistake. I remember the plagiarism debacle with the candidates. All of the blame could have been placed on me since it was on my team, but you took that responsibility. In that moment, I learned a lot from that. Thank you for showing me what it looks like to lead from a place of servanthood. Now, I sent that message to Tammy, and she wrote back to me, and she said, your words brought such joy to my day and help me wanna be an even better leader. Friends, what if we took the time to do that? What if we took the time this week to name people who've been that in our lives, and if they've already passed on, write a letter anyway. Name those qualities, because I think those are qualities that bring life to us, some of the greatest inspiration, 
that I've had in my life have come from incredible servant leaders. And I wonder if that's the case for you too. I wanna invite you to take some time to think about your own life this week. Do you have these qualities in your own life? Do a little assessment. How often do you sweep mistakes under the rug, hoping that no one will see? How often have you justified the things that have kept people from experiencing servant leadership? Do you hold that container of hope and possibility for every person that you work with? Look, David's not perfect. David made a big mistake. I mean, the fact that he can be forgiven for that is powerful, powerful stuff. But he owns up to it, and it makes him a better leader. And I bet we would all agree that if each person in this world owned up to their mistakes, the whole community would be better. Your home would be better. Your neighborhood would be better. Your church would be better. Your state, this nation, this world would all be better if we just named when we messed up. We get that example from David's leadership. So my hope this week is that you can do some reflective work to take some time to write about what is it that I need to own up for, or if not, to write about qualities that you've seen in others that have been servant leaders, ones that choose people and encourage people and go after people, because that is the world that God calls us to. And friends, the world needs the church right now. The world doesn't need the church. Tell them how bad they are. The world needs the church to be leaders, to go out into the world, to love people, and to put people first. Amen? Each week at Crossroads, we get the opportunity to come together in community to receive communion together. And and what does that mean? Communion is a time where we come to the table to be reminded of how loved we are. It's based on the example that Jesus gave that was based on the Passover meal, where he said, all people are welcome, come. And the ministry of Jesus, if you look at his whole time on earth, gives the message that there's nothing you can do that can earn coming to the table, and there's nothing you can do that can keep you away that God's love is powerful enough for each and every one of us. So you have the opportunity to come to the table today. All who desire to come can come. There'll be ushers that will direct you. If you need gluten-free, there'll be gluten-free bread and a cup for that in the center here, or there'll be at every station, there'll be these gluten-free cups that are prepackaged if you need that. If you're not comfortable receiving the bread in the cup quite yet, you can receive that at each station prepackaged as well but know that you are invited to come. That God wants you to know how loved you are, that you can step into that leadership as you do that. So on the night that Christ gave himself up for us, he sat around the table with the disciples who made lots of mistakes, by the way, in their leadership. Jesus regularly reminded them of the mistakes that they made and called them to step up. But as they sat around that table, Jesus wanted to remind them that not one of them was a mistake that every one of them was deeply loved. And at that table, he took bread, common food that they would have eaten regularly, nearly every day. And the first thing that he did was he gave thanks to God. And then he broke the bread. And he gave it to those disciples and he said, take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you as often as you eat bread. Jesus said, remember me. Remember that you're loved. Remember that you're important. Remember that you matter. Remember the calling that I have on your life to seek justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly. And after the supper, Jesus poured into the cup. Then he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to those disciples and he said, drink from this all of you for this is my blood of the new promise. Things are gonna be different. The new covenant, that new relationship poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink from the cup, Jesus said, remember me. Let's pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit, oh God, on all of us that are here and those that are online. 
and over these gifts of bread and juice and cup and, and over whatever gifts people have in their homes, pour out your Holy Spirit. Make these gifts be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might lead as servants and carry the body of Christ out into the world. And that we might recognize as we go, Christ, that you come with us, realizing that we are redeemed by your blood, by your Holy Spirit. Make us one, one with each other, one in connection to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory. On this Sunday called All Saints Sunday, let us be one with those that have gone before us, those that have come to tables like this and those that haven't. God, those that have poured into our lives, those who show us what it is to love, and God, that might be hard for some this morning as the loss is fresh. And that might be hard even if the loss has had some time, God, because of the impact that they've had on our lives. Let us be people, God, who own up to our mistakes. Let us be people who turn to you so that we can carry the life of Christ out into the world to love people, show them incredible grace, Come, Holy Spirit, over all of us here. Amen. I'm gonna invite those who are serving communion to come forward. As they come forward, again, I remind you, we'll have three stations. You'll be directed when to come. If you have your estimated giving card and wanna bring that forward, you can do that. Please hold on to your connection card till the end. But just know, y'all come on up. Just know that you're welcome to come to this table.
As we wrap up this time of our service, you saw some interesting signs on your way in this morning. Did you notice all those signs outside? And that is because this is a season of the year when we like to try to take time to say how much we appreciate our pastor, and we do. And I know that all of you do because he's an awesome pastor. And today, someone from our staff relations team, which is our HR team, would like to come and say a few words. So I want to invite Terry and Sandy Bradshaw up here. Give them a little hand as they come. Okay. Okay. I don't think we actually deserve a hand because we're late with our appreciation. And, <laughs> and we apologize yes. and wish to rectify. So anyway, as uh, Sandy said, I'm Terry Kennedy on staff relations team. And this is Sandy Bradshaw. Normally, Kirk Brandt would be up here our fearless SRT manager, uh, boss, but he is out of town this weekend, so stuck with us. Um, Tim, we want to appreciate you. We appreciate your enthusiasm for the Word of God, consistently illustrating ways the Bible is a living book and is relevant in our everyday lives, as exampled by today's message. Also, we appreciate your leadership, how you lead by example, but also by ceding control so others can flourish. And that was written before I knew what he was talking about today. Hi, I also wanna say how we truly love the way you truly have unlimited welcome in everything that Crossroads does. Um, it's in everything you say, it's in all your actions. We appreciate that. We also appreciate how you challenge us to inventory ourselves, making us think and find ways to be better children of God. Thank you. Let's give Tim a round of applause and appreciation. <laughs> we were. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Couple other things. We appreciate your generosity. I mean, with your time, you're here every day, all day, but not just with your time, with your mind share, your empathy, your mentoring of all of us. One other thing that we truly appreciate is how your family, thank you, Susan, and your children, how they share you with us and give of themselves as well as you giving to change one person, our community, and the world as we continue with the Crossroads mission. And then the last thing I added, as we were listening to today's message, um, the one more thing was that you have such a servant leadership role in all of the actions you take to support our team, and everyone who is part of Crossroads and beyond. So thank you. As we go out today, I wanna to invite you to stand. Just a couple things I wanna remind you of. If you or someone in your family would like to be baptized, there is a baptism workshop coming up on November 17th at 5 p.m. You can check that box on the connection card, which you can drop in the baskets on the way out, and someone will contact you with details about that. If you come to that baptism service, there will be opportunities for baptism to take place during the service, during the month of December. The other thing is next Sunday after church is Tea with Tim. If you haven't come to Tea with Tim, be sure and come to do that. There's good snacks to eat, but mainly you just get to sit with Tim, learn more about the church, ask him all the questions that you want to ask. So Tea with Tim next Sunday right after church. And if you want to pick up a Thanksgiving basket to fill, they are available in the hall. There's a list there that tells you exactly what should go in those baskets, and they will need to be returned back here to the church so they can be distributed on Saturday, November 19th, when you come to help us decorate the church, or on Sunday morning, November 20th. So take a Thanksgiving basket with you. Make somebody's holiday wonderful. Let's stand together. Tim has issued a real challenge to leadership this week as we go out. So I say go forth into the world. The world needs amazing leaders, and we can all be those leaders. So go out into the world to be humble, to own your mistakes, and to provide leadership for everyone that encounters you during the week. Go with God. <laughs>